Hello, everybody, and welcome into another episode of Ryan's Ramble. This is the fifth episode. I know I messed up last time. I accidentally said it was the third episode. College football's got my brain all sorts out of whack, all these lines, looking at all these numbers. Anyway, it's week five. Well, not college football week five, but episode five of Ryan's Ramble. My name is Ryan Bennell. I'm your host throughout this series. If you're unfamiliar with me, I am an associate editor over at Frogs of War. I've been writing for uh, Frogs of War now for just over a year. Love everything about it. Love what I do with them. Shout out to Frogs of War, as always, for this opportunity to have this podcast. And what is this podcast exactly? Well, this is your one-stop shop for all your college sports betting needs. Uh, We're definitely focusing on football right now, but of course going to move over into basketball when that season gets started as well. Um, And before we get started on any betting picks, any discussions like that, I do need to say that this is for entertainment purposes only. Sports betting is not legal in the state of Texas, and Frogs of War does not condone sports betting of any kind. This is not financial advice, you know, all that jazz, yada, yada. You get the gist, all right? I, I don't care what you do in your free time. I've said it before. I'll say it again. You could do whatever you want to do in your free time. If you have a bookie, that's on you. Hey, but anyway, we're going to have a good time. This is all about fun here. Even when we lose, we're going to have a good time, which is what we've learned in the past couple weeks. Not so much as bad as week one. Last week was still a bit of a struggle. We're going to talk about all of my picks from last week and a little bit more. But man, what a game over the weekend. TCU Cal. I'll talk about, I'll just touch on it a little bit. Don't want to go too deep in it. But man, what a game. That was not the game I was expecting in our uh, Frogs of War staff predictions. I believe I had it at 31 to 17. I thought it was going to be a low scoring game because uh, Cal, I mean, Cal is a good defense, but apparently not as good as Gary Patterson thought because the Frogs were able, able to drop 34 on them. I just really did not like what I saw from the Horn Frogs secondary. There were a few plays uh, where CJ, C- CJ Caesar especially got beat deep. That's something that Gary's got to adjust and will adjust. I mean, he's a defensive wizard, so. I'm not too worried about it, but man, uh, the Cal quarterback Garbers looked like a completely different player than the Cheez-It Bowl uh, game. Back in 2018, when TCU played Cal in the Cheez-It Bowl, they had the same quarterback. He went, I believe his stat line was nine for 18, like 93 yards and four interceptions in that game, which is astronomically and historically bad. Fast forward to you know this year's matchup, he dropped like 300 yards and a few touchdowns. He had a he had a hell of a game against what I thought you know was a great defense. But there there's some holes. It's only week two, a lot still to learn, a lot still to fix. But TCU got away with the win. That's really what matters. They didn't cover the spread though. You know this is a betting podcast, so got to talk about the lines. They did not cover the spread of minus 11 and a half. Uh, Cal covered that one. But the over did hit, so if you're into that kind of thing, that was a little fun. But before we get into any picks, before I make any predictions for this upcoming weekend in college football, I want to take a step back and look at the things we learned. I think this is a good way I want to start out these episodes uh, and kind of just highlight the main aspects from the past weekend or what I have realized or what sort of takes I have you know, gathered after watching these past games. So... First things first, I was dead wrong. I talked a lot of hubaloo about Miami. And one thing I learned this last week is Miami is not back. They hosted Appalachian State, who, don't get me wrong, is not a terrible team. I mean, they're really not. Of course, not a Power 5 team. Still not a terrible team. One of the better group of five teams, I would say. But Miami with Dara King, with all these expectations, you got to, they should win that game by double digits. Like, no questions about it, especially at home. Uh, they snuck away with a two-point win, 25-23. So, and also, not only that game, too, looking back at the Bama game, they only scored 13 points. We already talked about that. No need to dive into how bad and atrocious that game was for Miami. But Mercer, of all teams, Mercer scored more points on Alabama than Miami did. And if that doesn't tell you the U isn't back, I don't know what else will. I know Bama was playing backups. I know they were being very cautious towards the end of the game because it was a free dub. But still, that's kind of that's kind of funny when you think about it. I don't know. Mercer dropped 14. Miami only dropped 13 on Bama. So overall, Miami's not back. They have a, a big game against Michigan State. They, they did not make my card this week. I really really considered taking Michigan state plus six and a half because I'm just not, I'm again, I really, I fell off the high horse with Miami. I was, I was on it and already after two weeks, 
I am with gusto. I'm off that. I don't. I don't trust Miami whatsoever. Uh, another thing I learned this past weekend was that Oregon looked legit. It's always a good day when Ohio State loses. I mean, truthfully and honestly, uh, it was. All, it's always nice seeing a top five program go down whenever they're expected to make the playoffs every single year. <sighs> I could. That's a whole other conversation I could get into. But anyway, Ohio State lost in the horseshoe, I might add, which is a very rare feat for Oregon. Um, in Oregon, I wasn't too confident on. I mean, Ohio State was, I think, 14-point favorites in this matchup, and I wasn't so confident that the Buckeyes would cover the spread, but I was not confident on Oregon at all after their week one kind of scare they, they handled it. They won the game against Fresno State. But they were 21-point favorites, ended up coming away with a 7-point win against Fresno State, who isn't a terrible team in the Mountain West, but they shouldn't be competing with Oregon, realistically. Um, I'm excited to see what this Oregon team can do going forward. After this win, I would probably say they're front runners for the Pac-12. I've talked a lot about Utah, but they lost against BYU. We'll get into that one in a little bit, but... Utah was my front runner. UCLA is looking good. I think the Pac-12 is just wide open as always. So Oregon, though, they look legit. CJ Verdell is a beast. Give him the ball and just watch things happen. He ran rampant against the Buckeyes. He was a lot of fun to watch. Same thing, Anthony Brown is a solid quarterback as well. This looked like the classic Oregon offense. They have crazy fast skill players. Um, they're in a run-first mindset explosive type offense. It, this is like the Oregon we all know and love. It looked like, I don't want to say Chip Kelly reminiscence, but partially kind of, there was a little bit in there. Another thing I learned this weekend, and this is one of my favorite things to talk about. I may have talked about it every week by now. Don't know. Don't care. Going to keep doing it. Notre Dame is simply overrated. All right. They had a 32 to 29 close call against Toledo, which I picked by the way, I had Toledo plus 17 shout out to the Rockets. But, man, you know, they looked bad against in week one, coming away with that overtime scare against Florida State after the Seminoles iced their own kicker. Still mad about that. But anyway, Notre Dame got away with a close win in week one. And, you know, my original thought process was, hey, maybe Florida State's better than people are giving them credit for. Maybe this is a decent Seminole team. You know, it was a tough road test for Notre Dame. That's not the case. Absolutely not. Because look at what just happened to Florida State this weekend. Jacksonville State, the little old Gamecocks, got paid $400,000 in cold hard cash to drive down to Tallahassee and take on Florida State, where they somehow pulled off a prayer of a Hail Mary and won 20 to 17 at Florida State. It's one of the craziest plays I've seen in college football in a long time. You, if you have not seen it yet, I highly recommend you go recommend you go and watch the last second play they were at their own i think 40 yard line he just the quarterback heaves it down to the right sideline and okay i don't want to discredit jacksonville state's effort and because i mean the play was amazing right they did it came away with the play when they needed to got the dub but when you really watch that replay the florida state defenders gave up it's one of the saddest things i've ever seen i mean how can you just be so content and okay with just watching him walk into the waltz into the end zone and watch your team take another loss. I don't, maybe it's easy for me to say that from the comfort of my own chair, from my own bedroom, but I don't know. That kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Just seeing those Florida state defenders, maybe they're down for the count. They're just mentally defeated after losing in week one, but Jacksonville state, man, you can't do that. So that loss for Florida state actually hurts Notre Dame probably more than anybody. Because Notre Dame now looks even worse for struggling against Florida State. Struggled against Toledo. Got away with a last minute, not necessarily last minute, last few minute touchdown to uh, take the lead there. So I would I have a lot of concern for Notre Dame going forward. Um, they play Purdue this weekend. Purdue was originally 11-point underdogs, but now it's shifted all the way to 7-point underdogs. So clearly the public is favoring the Boilermakers and with good reason. But I typically would fade uh, the Irish. But because of that big line shift, because it went from 11 to 7, I'm, I'm staying away. So next up, another thing I learned is Iowa may have the best defense in the country. I Straight up, I think Iowa legitimately probably does have the best defense in the country. Uh, they went to Ames, went to Iowa State, got a 27 to 17 win despite being four-point underdogs and a great win. I mean, Iowa State looked rough in week one, but they're still a good ball team. They're still a good program. 
Uh, Brock Purdy is not the best quarterback in the world, right? He kind of fell off after his early Heisman expectations last year, but he's still a solid quarterback. I mean, but Iowa's defense held him to 13 for 27 with three interceptions, and I think it was around 150 yards. So, man, this Iowa defense is legit. This Iowa team is legit. I think they're a force to be reckoned with. Watch out. They might be an underdog play in the Big Ten. Like, legitimately, after that Ohio State loss, Iowa is an underdog play in the Big Ten. I am all in on the Hawkeyes. I'm, I'm, buying, I'm hopping on the bandwagon now before it's too late. Next up is, this one is probably going to be my favorite to talk about and probably your favorite to hear about if you're a Horned Frog fan. Welcome to the SEC Texas. Arkansas Razorbacks absolutely handed it to the Longhorns, 40-29. to It was not a game ever throughout this entire contest. It was not close, not competitive. Arkansas embarrassed them. You know, Texas, of course, it was a road game for Texas. And whoo! Big suey. That's a tough place to play. It, it is a tough place to play. Um, but I don't want to give Texas any credit because they don't deserve any. They lost. They suck. They stink. They don't deserve the SEC. They're going to lose every game. Ah! Okay? That's how I feel right now. Um, anyway, everything about this makes me happy. Just seeing Texas lose makes me happy. Seeing all the memes on Twitter makes me so happy. Seeing Arkansas put the horns down on the jumbotron makes me incredibly happy. That's probably my favorite part about all of this. You know, you have the big 12 where you made it literally a rule where teams opposing teams will be penalized for throwing up the horns down logo. Now you go to the sec to a league that doesn't give a shit. They don't care. They don't care about your feelings. Texas teams are going to do this for the first couple years. I hope, I hope everybody does this. The horns down on the jumbotron, everything, the whole shebang. Cause if Texas can't beat a low tier sec team, and that's what Arkansas is, they've gotten better over the past couple years, but Arkansas is a low tier sec team. If Texas can't beat them newsflash, buddy, you're not going to have winning season in there. Okay. If you can't beat the bottom tier, you can't beat the top tier. Simple math. <sighs> Enough on that though. Another one, these are just, man, these are just fun topics for me. This was a good weekend for my hatred per se. My, uh, my, you know, Notre Dame, USC, I've, you guys will probably get to know my teams that I just truly despise by the end of the season. And these are some of them. USC overrated. They were 17 point favorites at home against Stanford in the Coliseum lost by 14. That's a 31 point swing. When you look at the spread, that's crazy. I didn't actually pick Stanford on this. But I did call it that USC was overrated. I was just a game too early. Um, and speaking of USC, though, I mean, who's going to be their ne next head coach? That's a really interesting conversation right now in the college football world. You know, you got the favorites, of course, James Franklin, Luke Fickle. Um, ironically, Urban Meyer is the third highest favorite, which I think is absurd. Even though in his press conference, he said there's no chance he's going to USC. I don't believe it. I don't believe it, Urban. I saw you. I saw your body language. I saw the way you were looking at the can. I don't know, Urban. He's a weird dude. He's a weird dude, and I wouldn't really put it past him. I give the, I give that like a one percent chance for Urban to just dip out of the NFL like that. It would be crazy. It'd be bonkers if he actually did it. But realistically, I think Luke Fickle's probably the number one candidate for that job. It would kind of bum me out to see him leave Cincinnati after he's built that program up to a top ten team. Uh, I really do want to see Cincinnati to continue to succeed, especially now that they're coming to the Big 12. I want to see them continue to succeed, be a top 25 team every year. And if they lose their coach, then might put a damper on things. Um, but it, it is what it is. I mean, UCF, you look back, UCF lost their head coach, Scott Frost, and now they're fine. They're, they got Gus Malls on. They're still fine. They're okay. So I think it just is a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but, yeah, that's really – those were my main points that I wanted to discuss from last week. Those were my favorite – takeaways the things i learned all that jazz uh now let's just glance over before we get into this upcoming week's picks let's glance over last week's picks just to touch on what we did right what we did wrong uh we ended up going five and seven on the week which is not ideal but after week one hey sh i'll take that it's improvement we're getting better we just got to get on the winning path we have to get on the winning path this week there's nothing more to it that simple that's the bottom line so last week we had UTEP plus 26 and a half, which was dumb. I knew that was dumb. I, I told you guys it was dumb when I did it and I still did it anyway. So that one's on me. All right. No, no excuses. That one's, that one's just on me for believing in the minors for some 
godforsaken reason. Uh, next up in tier three, we had the Rutgers and Syracuse under hit. That was all that game went almost exactly how I expected it to really low scoring Toledo plus 17 hit. So I went two and two on tier three, uh, I move on to tier two, Ohio state. I had their team total of over 39. They got really close actually to forcing overtime, which probably would have meant the team total would have hit. So that would have been neat to see, but I would probably rather see Ohio state lose. That was more enjoyable in my opinion. Oh, excuse me. I got the hiccups now. But Utah, they disappointed me. I had Utah minus seven. Utah disappointed in the holy war against BYU. But, I mean, maybe we underestimated BYU post Zach Wilson. I'll talk about that in a little bit because they made my card this week. Uh, another game in Tier 2 is Florida International against Texas State. You know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm the degenerate for betting on a game of this caliber, but – FIU blew it. They had the game. They blew it, sent it into overtime, blew it in overtime. Just a whole bunch of choking. A lot of choking going on for FIU. And then Pittsburgh. Uh, Pittsburgh made me proud. I was very happy to see Pittsburgh cover the spread against Tennessee. And like I said, I will never believe in the volunteers until the volunteers give me something to believe in. And they haven't done it for years. So why should I? <sighs> now, other, uh, moving on to my tier one picks. Um, Excuse my language, but the Boston College UMass over under was bullshit. All right. I have never seen something so preposterous in my life. The The game had 14 points in the first half. Right. And so I, I checked the score at halftime. I'm like, oh, I'm golden. Right. They're on pace to, to hit 28, let alone 59. Nope. I was wrong. Next time I checked my phone, Boston College UMass put up a 42 point third quarter all hell broke loose in the third quarter i don't know what happened but i'm fed up <clears throat> i hated that i hated watching i didn't get to watch it i just watched the notifications on my phone ding ding touchdown touchdown and the under just kept getting uh, closer and closer until eventually it broke and we lost that bet but buffalo plus 14 they were non-existent in, in that game against nebraska i actually had a lot of faith in that one i couldn't tell you what what went wrong. That one's on me, I guess. Uh, didn't do enough homework on Nebraska. I've kind of been riding the riding the momentum on their. I don't know how to word it, but just the hate, really. I mean, they're kind of in the gutter right now as a program. So, next up, though, to finish out tier one, we had a couple of wins. Iowa was the lock of the century, plus four and a half. Uh, depending on how many units you laid on it, I actually that was my biggest play of the weekend, personally, unit wise. So, if you guys want me to track units, uh, actually leave a comment below or something. That's something I could definitely do. We just take a little bit of math, you know, tracking all the numbers and everything like that. But I think that would be interesting to put some units on it rather than just having my record. So let me know if that's something y'all are interested in. I could definitely uh, work on that. But last win was Michigan. They covered the first half spread of minus three and a half against Washington. I really think Michigan's back. I really, really like this Wolverine team this year. They had two running backs with over 150 yards. The offense is clicking. They held Washington at 10 points, looked solid on defense. And I know Washington's offense isn't a force to be reckoned with, but they looked good. I, I really like Michigan going forward as well. They're another team to walk, watch out. So that five and seven week brings my record to 10 and 17, which I'm not proud of, all right? I'm not, I'm not proud of it, but I'm not going to hide from it. I'm not ashamed of it. This is, this is sports betting. These things happen. This is, it is what it is, all right? It's one of my favorite sayings. It is what it is. Um, we live and we learn. We, we move on. We adjust. We're going to get things right. You know, we had that, those things we learned this week. We're going to use those, put those to our advantage, and now we're going to hit our week three college football picks. Let's get it. Now, TCU, I usually start out with my thoughts on the TCU game. TCU's on a bye week, so nothing going on there. My only advice is enjoy the time to watch a full slate of college football. You can watch it from the 11 a.m. games to the 2 a.m. finishes in the Pac-12. It's beautiful. It's glorious. So enjoy this slate of games. My first pick, I started out with a dumb pick last week. I'm going to do it again this week, all right? So in advance, I'm telling you this is a dumb pick, but it's a dumb pick that I really like and I really actually think my hit. Uh, Kansas. Kansas plus 18. You heard it here first. Kansas plus 18 to cover at home against Baylor. I believe in miracles, frankly. That, that's it. I believe in miracles. I think there's a chance. 
Um, Baylor couldn't even cover the spread against damn Texas State at minus 14. So who's to say they wouldn't you know, blow it against Kansas as well? Kansas has shown some form of competency on offense this season. I mean, they dropped 22 points against Coastal Carolina. Not a crazy good defense, but still nice to see some sort of production from the Jayhawks. So really, I mean, Baylor couldn't do it against Texas State. They can't do it against Kansas. I think Kansas has a legitimate shot of keeping this within 10, let alone 18. I think we may see this be a 10-point ball game, but Baylor's going to win realistically. How cool would it be, though, to see Kansas win? We could just make fun of Baylor fans forever, literally forever. Um, I'm also taking another Tier 3 pick I'm going to be doing is by the way, I forgot to explain this. I'll take a little back step. So if you're unfamiliar with this system, I go based on confidence. Tier three are my least confident picks. Tier two, my eh, middle range confidence. And tier one are my absolute favorite. Some of them are my locks of the week. So that, that's the format we're rolling with this season. So moving on with it, keep going with the tier three picks. I'm taking another one in the Kansas Baylor game. I'm taking the over of 49. Simply, I'm going to follow the money. All right, there's some sharp indications right now. Uh, 56% of public bets are siding with Kansas, or not Kansas, but I mean with the over. And meanwhile, 92% of the total money placed on this line is with the over. So that's an indication that some of the big betters, heavy players, are taking the over. They're rocking with it. And I am too. Uh, I mean, Kansas, what was it? I think they had 71 points in their game against Coastal Carolina. South Dakota was just a shit show. We don't even need to talk about that. Baylor just dropped 60 some points. Uh, so 49 and a half really isn't that much to go for in this one, especially if the game goes how I'm planning. If Kansas actually does play somewhat competitive, then there's a higher chance for the over to hit. So that's why though they're both in my tier three, uh, more confident on the over actually than I am Kansas. So <clears throat> moving on now is BYU plus four against Arizona state. And they're at home as well. And BYU is a pretty tough place to play. As we saw in the Holy War, Utah came to town. They struggled a bit. Did not play nearly as well as I thought they would. I thought Utah would have handled that game swimmingly. But BYU looked good. I mean, I think that the market has over-adjusted to BYU in the post-Zach Wilson era. I think they're being underrated and not talked about because they just lost a player of the caliber of Zach Wilson, you know, big shoes to fill, but quarterback Jaron Hall is a, he's solid. He's looked fine in their first couple games. Um, he, he big shoes to fill, but he's doing well so far. I don't think he's going to be the next Zach Wilson or any bold statement like that, but he can lead this offense. They can, they can do some good things. They did it against Utah. Uh, I'm really, again, I love, as well now on the Arizona State side of things. I love Herm Edwards as a coach, as a person. Very entertaining when he was uh, an analyst, but I'm not buying in. I'm not buying into this Arizona State team, uh, and I don't think I will for any time soon. I just, that Pac-12 is, they never live up to expectations. A 23rd ranked team in the Pac-12 is just about a, as good as the seventh team in the Big 12, all right? So rankings in the Pac-12, standings early season especially, are very subjective for Pac-12 teams. Uh, I don't think Arizona State should be a top 25 team. Again, that may be my famous last words, but I'm taking BYU mostly because one of my, one of my big faults this season already has been I have just completely ignored home field advantage. That's something I've, you know, that went out the window with COVID. There was no fans in the stands. Everything was quiet. There was almost no home field advantage, whereas now it's almost double a factor because some of these you know, players that were freshmen last year have never experienced these stadiums at full capacity, full roar, everything like that. They've never had to deal with the hostility. And so I think home field advantage is a big factor this year when you look at betting. And BYU is the home team. Beautiful place to play. I'm actually looking forward to maybe going to a few away games in – down the road, a few years down the road, you know, when BYU is in the conference, they have a beautiful stadium. So take, take BYU, take the Cougars plus four to cover against Arizona state. Now my next one is also an underdog pick. I'm going to be taking, this is a big, big, big pick. I normally don't like betting on spreads like this large, but I'm taking South Carolina plus 31 and a half against Georgia. This is strictly a system play. 
The system has a 58% win percentage since the year 2007. It focuses on um, large spreads with low over-unders. So basically, if you look at these lines, the over-under is set at 47, which is incredibly low for a game where there's a team that's favored by 31 and a half. Uh, so basically, the projection, or Vegas has the exact projection to be 38 to 9, or 39 to 8, excuse me, as the final score, essentially, which Georgia, they're probably going to play cautious late in this game because this should be an easy win. South Carolina may play big because this may be like their Super Bowl of the year type game. But I mean, of course, they're, they're in the SEC. They play a lot of big teams. Don't get me wrong, but they may play up because they need to because they have nothing to lose, whereas Georgia has everything to lose. So the large, large spread, low total equals big opportunity for betting. Uh, I think Georgia's going to dominate in this one. And even if they win by like 28, they don't cover the spread, right? That's four touchdowns. They don't cover the spread. So plus 31 and a half for South Carolina is another one of my tier three plays. And then to round out my tier three, I'm going with the road runners of UTSA in the first half against Middle Tennessee. So the line on that one is UTSA minus seven in the first half. I was wrong about the road runners originally. I will admit, uh, I had I, I picked Illinois against them in, in my week one disaster. And maybe, you know, karma, that's what I get for picking against them. UTSA has an explosive run attack. Their offense is really in, interesting to watch. Um, if they can beat Illinois on the road, they can cover a first half spread against Middle Tennessee at home. Uh, seven points isn't too much to ask for. They've gotten off to great starts in the first half uh, in both their games so far. So, I'm, I'm sticking with the Roadrunners to, to correct my wrongdoings from week one. So take UTSA minus seven first half. That's it for my tier three picks. Moving on now are my tier two picks. Now, you know, we had we had a lot of success actually last year. I don't have the exact numbers behind it. I would have to go back and look to track things down. But we had a lot of success taking Alabama's first quarter spreads last year uh, in the written version of Ryan's Ramble. So to start off my tier two picks, I'm going going back to it. Alabama minus three and a half for the first quarter. That's a big key. First quarter only. Alabama to cover the minus three and a half spread at Florida. I think you know the Florida defense is going to be no test for Bryce Young uh, and, and Co. and Nick Saban. Like this is what they do, right? They go into these hostile environments where rumors are like, oh, this could be upset. You know, there's a lot of experts actually siding with Florida to cover the plus 15 spread, full game spread, which, you know, I learned my lesson, right? I bet against Alabama in week one against Miami. They absolutely obliterated them. I, I will never, I am so sorry, Nick Saban. I will never do that again. I learned my lesson. So I got to go with Crimson Tide in the first quarter. They're notorious for getting off to hot starts. They, I mean, they do it every Every week, really, they have a, a bang in first quarter, if not at least the first half. So in this one, I, I really wouldn't be surprised too if we saw something like a, a seven to three first quarter or even like a 14 to 10. That wouldn't be too crazy. But hey, that's a four point margin that covers a three and a half spread. That's all we need. That's not too much to ask for. Really, all you need to do is ask for Alabama to score a touchdown on the first drive. And I mean, chances are Alabama's going to score on their first drive, just realistically. They're so ex their offense is so exciting to watch. Bryce Young, John Mechie, they're so good. They're so good. All right. Next up on my tier two picks uh, is San Jose State minus six and a half on the road at Hawaii. I think this line is incredibly low, this spread of six and a half. I would have projected this to be closer to nine, nine and a half uh, if I was the one setting these lines, which, you know, of course, the odds makers know more than me. But this is it seems like an over-adjustment to me. San Jose State got a bit of respect from odds makers against USC in, in which USC just went on to dominate the game and kind of prove the odds makers wrong to an extent. So maybe I think they're overcorrecting their original mistake, which is what I'm going to take advantage to correct my last mistake on San, San Jose State. Hawaii is not a good team. The only reason I would be nervous about this is because it's on the road at Hawaii, which any team not from Hawaii that has to travel to Hawaii, that's going to be, you know, shake things up a little bit. Uh, I rode with the Spartans, didn't go well, but yeah, this is just too low. So only reason this isn't a tier one pick is because of that road factor. I would almost put this in the tier one 
cal category. Uh, Hawaii, though, they're just not great. They lost 45 to 27 against a bad Oregon State team, which is a pretty big margin of victory, if I do say so myself. So I think asking for a seven point win from San Jose State is not too much to ask for. D defending Mountain West champions went seven and zero last year in the weird COVID year. Tough loss against USC on the road, but you know that's that's something that San Jose State's got to get used to playing on those hostile road environments against power five teams. If they actually do want to become one of those elite group of five teams, like we see with Cincinnati, Memphis, I consider Memphis up there, UCF, those guys. So yeah. So anyway, take San Jose state minus six and a half kind of rambled on them a little bit, but I really do like that spread a lot. Uh, I need a, I need a little sippy sip. Mm. All right. Got to stay hydrated, you know? Anyway, moving on now, Tier 2. Still on Tier 2. We're going with Georgia Tech at Clemson. I'm taking the over of 52 points. And generally, I think Clemson might score all 52 by themselves. Uh, really, not to shit on Georgia Tech too much, but their defense isn't fantastic. Their offense is a bit unpredictable. They dropped their opening game to Northern Illinois despite being 18-point favorites. So... And then they blew out Kennesaw State, which is to be expected. So I don't know what to expect from the Yellow Jackets. I really don't. There's a bit of hype around quarterback Jeff Sims. They have the whole culture with uh, Jeff Mitchell, I believe is their head coach's name. Uh, spelled Geoff. That's how I always remember it. But Jeff, uh, they have a great culture going on. The recruiting is heated up. But for some reason, they just can't get it going on the field. Um and the reason that I'm going with the overs is because I think Georgia Tech's offense is so unpredictable that they might be able to drop 14 points or a couple touchdowns here and there on Clemson. Uh, and I think Clemson, again, has the capability of potentially scoring all 52 points themselves here. So I'm taking the over in that one. Uh, and also siding with the Sharps, too. I love Sharp indicators, big fan of these. Sometimes I do fade them if uh, too many people are picking them. But we're going public is 50-50 on this one. 50% of the bets are on the under, 50% are on the over. But the real kicker is 91% of the money on this line is placed with the over. So that's an indicator, again, that those big money ballers, those uh, professional bettors, those sharps are taking the over in this one. So we're going to follow their lead. We're going to take the over to over 52 in the Georgia Tech Clemson game. Next up, we're switching from the over, and now we're taking an under. I'm going with Virginia Tech at West Virginia to hit under 50.5. I really, really have a feeling almost similar to that Rutgers-Syracuse feeling I had, where I just have a feeling this is going to be a defensive, low-scoring battle, two capable offenses, but everything changes in a rivalry game. You know, West Virginia, I know it's Big 12 defense, but last year had the number one Big 12 defense. So they have a, a decent unit on the field. Um, Virginia Tech, low-scoring game against UNC, even though it was supposed to be like over-under was set at like 65, I think it was in that one. Ended up with a combined 27. So I think these defenses are going to come to play for the rivalry game. I'm really tempted to take West Virginia minus 2.5 because they already have that loss to Maryland. They need to get on the winning record. And who else to do it against their rival, you know? So I was really tempted, and because of home field advantage. I talked about that being a huge factor, and I still think it is. Lane Stadium is a huge factor for Virginia Tech. A huge factor for Virginia Tech. So you take away Lane Stadium, I don't know. I actually really might add West Virginia now that I'm talking about it more. So <laughs> we'll see what happens. But uh, to round out my Tier 2 picks, uh, I'm going to go with – this one's a little ballsy, a little risky. But, again, I hate these 20-point spreads. I don't like them. They're stressful that you sweat a lot during them, but this one really caught my eye. I'm going with UMass, the Minutemen, plus 22 against East, Eastern, Eastern Michigan. God, I can't talk, but UMass plus 22. They're normally like 40, 50 point underdogs in every single game they play. So it's a little interesting to see it mixed up. Only three possessions underdogs, but I mean, Eastern Michigan. They're Eastern Michigan. What more can I say? They're not a glorious program by any means. And the reason, though, I'm going with this UMass pick is they played Boston College last week. They screwed me over by busting the, the under. But they had a 45-28 a to 28 loss. And it sounds ironic, but that was one of the best things to happen to UMass football in the last 10 years. Losing to Boston College by only 17 points? That's insane. They were 38-point underdogs. 
lost by 17. That's a win in my book, all right? Put a, put a check in the UMass win column. I don't care. That counts, all right? This is the start of a dynasty for the Minutemen. They're about to take the college football world by storm, all right? They're going to be covering spreads left and right. I don't care who they play. It could be a 10-point, 20-point, 40-point, 60-point spread. UMass, they're the Minutemen. I mean, they're the Minutemen, all right? Now, we need the men to minute. I don't know what I'm saying. All right. I just want them to win. All right. That's that's what you need to take away from this. UMass plus 22. They're going to cover it against Eastern Michigan. And I really, really have a like 1% feeling that they actually might come away with some crazy upset. Okay. So just wanted to put it on record in case it does happen that I, I did think it. All right. But I'm never going to place any, any bets on a plus 2,000 money line. That's just absurd. Well, who do you think I am? Vegas Dave? Absolutely not. All righty. Here we go. It's time for the big guns. We moved on. Done with tier three. Done with tier two. It's tier one time. I kind of, my organization this week was a little bit different. Last week I had four, four, four. It kind of worked out evenly throughout the tiers, but uh, I only have three picks that I'm super confident on uh, this week. And to start those off, my first one is Nevada at Kansas State over 50.5. I think this is a relatively low over under set for these teams. Uh, both are capable offenses. You look at Nevada, Carson Strong, just beat Cal. I mean, they beat Cal week one, same as TCU. Um, but both capable offenses, they combined, these teams combined points average is 63, which is well above the total, 12 and a half points above the total, which is a good indicator. Skylar Vaughn, or I mixed up their names, Skylar Thompson, Deuce Vaughn. They have guys that can score on the field. Carson Strong, I mean, he has, NFL talent after him eventually. So Carson Strong can put up numbers as well. I think this is going to be, I wouldn't say a shootout necessarily, but this is going to be a close game. I mean, Kansas State are two point underdogs, which I'm surprised about. Might lean towards Kansas State plus two on that one. Um, didn't make an official pick on it though, just because I'm not super confident. I, after that, I think it was Southeastern Illinois, some weird no name doo doo doggy program. They beat them 31 to 23 at home. Close call. Not crazy close call, but close enough to be concerned. So that's why I'm staying away. Uh, but I, I'd rather go with the over. So take over 50.5. That is one of my favorite picks of this weekend and between Nevada and Kansas State. So moving on now as well, sticking with the state program, I'm going Kent State. This one might be my absolute favorite number one lock of the week. Kent State team total under 17.0. All right. This leaves a lot of room for a push. I did. I know these lines may have shifted by the time this gets posted. I did get a lot of these lines early when they first were published. So, and it also depends on your book where you get these lines. Most of these are pulled from DraftKings. Uh, but Kent State team total under 17.0 because they're traveling to Iowa and taking on the Hawkeyes. And man, they only dropped 10 points against Texas A&M on the road. I don't see how they're going to drop more than 10 against Iowa on the road. I said it before in this episode, Iowa is probably the best defense in the country at this point. They look fantastic. They play a very cautious game. They're going to focus on defense the whole time, regardless of the score. I, I just don't see Kent State dropping 17 points on them. That If, if Iowa can hold Iowa State to 17, in Ames, I might add, then they can hold Kent State to less than 17 in Iowa, right? or Iowa City, I, I believe. I'm not 100% sure where their stadium is. I think it's Iowa City. Don't quote me on that. But love, I, I've said it before too, I love Iowa home games. I love seeing their tradition of waving to the hospital. One of my favorite things of college football, one of the reasons the sport is amazing. Um, that's going to be a fun one to watch because I'm just going to watch zero touchdowns be put up by Kent State. One of the only times I'll ever celebrate going scoreless. Next up, to round out our picks for this week and to round out the episode, we're going with Penn State versus Auburn. I'm taking the Nittany Lions to cover minus five. And strictly, all you need to know for this one, three words. Ready? White out game. Boom, done. Lock it in, hammer it. It's a wide out game. Penn State's the home team. Their crowd's going to be absolutely insane. I talked about the home field aspect already. 
this this is the home field aspect, right? Lane Stadium is another one. The, no, this is the home field a- atmosphere. Penn State's wideout game. I would do. I would give an arm and a leg to attend that just as a neutral fan, just to see. Oh man, it just looks so awesome to be there. I I love watching videos of their wideout introductions. Everything. It's going to be electric when Auburn comes to town. Penn State's going to want to get that dub. They're going to want to stay undefeated. And uh, also, now that we're talking about Penn State, <clears throat> this reminded me of the James Franklin bit with uh, Keegan Key. If you don't know Keegan Michael Key, he's the comedian actor from uh, Key and Peel. Uh, he's a Penn State alumni, and he ironically looks like a skinnier version of James Franklin. Like they both have that bald head. Uh, he just needed to add a little bit of stubble, and then he was in a little disguise in a Penn State polo and everything. And he, you know, entered the locker room pretending to be the coach. And I just thought that was pretty funny. Some wholesome content, you know. But back to the game. Bo Nix is incredibly overrated. Sure, he has an NIL deal with uh, one of my favorite sweet tea companies, Milo's. But I don't care, all right? You, you can sign all the money you want, get all the ads you want. Doesn't matter if you can't produce on the football field. Bo Nix is going to get shut down against Penn State this weekend. Just watch it happen. Uh, this line actually moved minus six to minus five in favor of Auburn. Um, so that's interesting, I think so. But I'm still riding with Penn State regardless. I would really love if this line moved to minus four for the option for a push on like a, say, I don't know, 17-13 type situation, you know. But regardless, Penn State minus five, I think it's a lock. I think they win this game by at least a touchdown. So lock that one in. And that 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 wraps up the episode. So I got to. Another hiccup. These uh these modelos are getting to me. You know, it's modelo time here. Thursday night, modelo time, man. All right. But anyway, that's all I got for this week. Those are all my picks. A lot going this weekend. A lot riding on my confidence. You know, after week one's fiasco, week two, it wasn't terrible, but five and seven isn't ideal by any means. So Feels good to be back, though. Feels good to be making picks, as always. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this weekend of football, being able to watch the full slate of games. And, and not that you know going to a TCU game is a bad thing by any means. I would much rather go to the TCU game, all right? But sometimes it's nice to just sit on your couch, ignore all your responsibilities, and not move for 12 hours while you watch football. And then you can do it all again on Sunday for the NFL. Yay! All right, well, that's going to be it for this episode, guys. Best of luck, whether you tail or fade my picks on this blog and podcast. Best of luck this weekend. Leave some comments below. I want to hear what you guys are taking, who you guys are betting, some trends, some parlays you got going. Lay it all out there. Let's talk about it. I'm probably going to be putting some parlays in there as well. So check the written version of Ryan's Ramble to see my additional picks. I'll probably be adding those in the comments because I think I might be bringing back the Paradise City parlay from last year. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. But alas, enjoy your college football weekend. Thank you for tuning in. And I will be back same time, same place next week to bring you more of my college football picks.